The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 7 What on earth could she think of to say next? Kit wondered in desperation. She sat looking down at her folded hands, reluctant to lift her eyes to the young man who sat on the bench across the wide hearth. She knew that when she looked up, she would find William Ashby's gaze fixed steadily upon her. For the last half hour they had sat so. When a young man came to call, what did one talk about? Was it all up to the girl? She had tried her best, but William seemed content to just sit, his back stiffly straight, his large, capable hands resting squarely on his sturdy, wool-clad knees. He looked impressive in his cinnamon broadcloth coat and the fine linen shirt. His glossy beaver hat and white gloves had laid carefully on a chair near the door. William seemed to feel that merely by coming he had done his share. Apparently it was up to her to provide the conversation. Aunt Rachel had laid a special fire in the company room and set lighted candles on the table. From the kitchen across the hall, Kit could hear the voices of the family as they sat cozily about the evening fire that was still welcome on these cool May evenings. Tonight she longed to be with him. She would welcome even the Bible reading at this moment. She took a deep breath and tried again. Is it always so chilly in New England, even in May? William considered this. I think this spring it is a bit warmer than usual, he decided. As though in answer to her urgent prayer for relief, a knock sounded on the outside door. And it was Aunt Rachel who went to answer. Kit heard John Holbrook's voice. Her aunt welcomed him cordially, and in a few moments put her head in at the parlor door, her understanding glance taking in the two silent young people. Why don't you both come and join us, she suggested. John Holbrook has come to call, and we can pop some corn for a treat. Bless Aunt Rachel. Over a handful of fluffy white kernels, William relaxed a trifle. There was something irresistible about popcorn. John and his pale cheeks, flushed with the heat, managed the long shaker with a practiced hand. Judith blossomed suddenly in the firelight, and her laughter was infectious. Mercy's eyes were shining with pleasure. Rachel, with a ghost of the charm she must have once possessed, succeeded in drawing William, if not actually into the circle, at least to its warm circumference. Even Matthew unbent enough to ask courteously, Does your father have all his fields sown? Yes, sir, replied William. Notice he's cutting some trees up vexation way. Yes, I'm planning to build my house come autumn. We have marked some good white oak for the clapboards. Kit stared at him. William had not spoken so many words all evening. Aunt Rachel encouraged him. My husband tells me that you have been appointed a viewer of fences, she smiled. That is a fine honor for so young a man. Thank you, ma'am. With all the new land grants I've been hearing of, that will be an important duty, added Mercy helpfully. Yes, agreed William. The Assembly has voted that there should be no unclaimed land left in all Hartford County. A wise move, put in Matthew. Why should we leave land for the King's governor to grant to his favorites? William turned to the older man respectfully. Are you not afraid, sir, he asked that we are likely to anger the king the more by such hasty actions. Are you so afraid to anger the king, scuffed Matthew? No, sir, but we cannot hope to hold out against him. If we submit to his governor now without a struggle, are we not more likely to retain for ourselves some rights and privileges? By provoking his anger, we may lose them all. Kit could scarcely believe her ears. William Ashby was neither speechless nor dim-witted. He even dared to stand up to her uncle. With new respect, she moved to pass the wooden bowl of popcorn, and to it she added a smile that caused him to lapse into scarlet-faced silence. Matthew Wood did not notice the interruption. 
Surrender our charter and we lose all, he thundered. The charter was given to Connecticut by King Charles 25 years ago. It guarantees every right and privilege we have earned, and the very ground we stand on, and the laws we've made for ourselves. King James has no right to go back on his brother's privilege. What do you say, Master Holbrook? Or has your teacher poisoned your mind as well? I believe we should keep the charter, sir. John's eyes were on the fire, and his voice sounded troubled. But Dr. Bulkley says that Connecticut has misinterpreted the charter. His knowledge of the law is so wide. He says that justice is not always served by our courts, and... Bah! Matthew Wood pushed back his chair and rose to his feet. Justice! What do you young men know about rights and justice? A soft life is all you have ever known. Have you ever felled the trees in a wilderness and built a home with your bare hands? Have you fought off the wolves and the Indians? Have you frozen and starved through a single winter? The men who made this town understood justice. They knew better than to look for it in the king's favor. The only rights worth all that toil and sacrifice are the rights of free men, free and equal under God to decide their own justice. You'll learn, mark my words, someday you'll learn to your sorrow. He stumped off up the stairs without a good night. Oh dear, could there never be a pleasant moment without this senseless argument? After Matthew's departure, the conversation never really righted itself. Kit jumped as the square clock in the corner twanged eight o'clock. Only one hour. It seemed like the longest evening she had ever lived through. William rose deliberately to his feet. Thank you for your hospitality, Mistress Wood, he said politely. John looked up, startled that the time had passed so quickly, and followed William's example. As the door shut behind their backs, a long sigh escaped Kit. Well, that's over with, she exclaimed. At least we won't have to go through it again. Not until next Saturday night, at least, laughed Mercy. Kit shook her head positively. He'll never come again, she said. Was she altogether relieved at the thought? Why, whatever makes you say that, child, asked Rachel, busily raking up the fire. Couldn't you see? He hardly spoke a word to me. And then Uncle Matthew. Oh, they all know about the father. Judith dismissed the quarrel airily. William said he was starting to build his house, didn't he? What more could you want him to say? He just happened to mention that. William Ashby never just happened to mention anything in his life, said Judith. He knew exactly what he was saying. I can't see why just building a house. Don't you know anything, Kit? scoffed Judith. William's father gave him that land three years ago on his 16th birthday. And William said that he would never start to build a house until his mind was made up. That's ridiculous, Judith. He couldn't mean any such thing. So soon, could he, Mercy? I'm afraid he could. Mercy smiled at her cousin's confusion. I agree that William was telling all of us, you most of all, that his mind is made up. Whether you like it or not, Kit, William is going to come courting. But I don't want him to. Kit was close to panic. I don't want him to come at all. We, we can't even talk to each other. Seems to me you're pretty choosy, snapped Judith. Don't you know William is able to build the finest house in Weatherfield if he wants to? Does he have to keep you amused as well? Rachel put a reassuring hand on Kit's shoulder. The girls are only teasing you, Catherine, she said gently. Then you don't think... Yes, I do think William is serious. But you don't need to be worried, dear. No one is going to hurry you, least of all William himself. He is a very fine young man. Of course, you feel like strangers now, but I think you'll find sufficient to talk about before long. But would they? Kit wondered, climbing the stairs to bed.
Her doubts persisted through the week. A second Saturday passed, a third and a fourth, and William's calls fell into a pattern. I shall ask Mercy to teach me to knit, Kit decided after the second Saturday. And thereafter, she armed herself with wool and needles. At least they kept her hands occupied and gave her an excuse for not meeting that implacable gaze. William seemed to find nothing lacking in those evenings. For him, it was enough simply to sit across the room and look at her. It was flattering, she had to admit. The most eligible bachelor in Weathersfield, and handsome, actually in his substantial way. Sometimes as she sat knitting, aware that William's eyes were on her face, she felt her breath tightening in a way that was strange and not unpleasant. Then, just as suddenly, rebellion would rise in her. He was so sure. Without even asking, he was reckoning on her as deliberately as he calculated his growing pile of lumber. Perhaps she would not have thought about William so much had there been anything else to break the long, monotonous stretch from Saturday to Saturday. It was incredible that every day should be the same, varied only in the work that filled every hour from sunrise to dark. Surely, it seemed, there must come a moment when all the tasks would be done and some brief leisure earned, yet always a new chore loomed ahead. A shearing had brought a veritable mountain of gray wool to be washed and bleached and dyed, enough to keep Mercy carding and spinning and weaving for the next twelve months. There was water to draw and linen to scrub and, everlastingly, the endless row of vegetables to weed and hoe. Kit had not found a single one of these tasks to her liking. Her hands were unskillful, not so much from inability as from the rebellion that stiffened her fingers. She was Catherine Tyler. She had not been reared to do the work of slaves. And William Ashby was the only person in Weathersfield who did not expect her to be useful, who demanded nothing and offered his steady admiration as proof that she was still of some worth. No wonder that she found herself looking forward to Saturday evening. And we'll start on Chapter 8 in the next video. Till then, thanks so much for listening. I love you guys. Bye-bye.